Uh, before I welcome our, any of our guests, I'd just like to invite those uh, who have not already done so to please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Magnamind Academy. We upload uh, recorded sessions of these talks. You can watch them later. And you can also watch a live stream on YouTube to comment questions or just any other uh, thoughts you have about today's talk. I'd like to now welcome Enrico Santos, who will be presenting his talk on uh, natural language processing, challenges, and opportunities in healthcare. At Magnamind, we really uh, like to try and find speakers who will give a different kind of perspective or a different kind of knowledge that goes along with our uh, data science education programs, but uh, is supposed to basically accompany those programs. Uh, these ones range from focusing on maybe a fundamental skill or two of data science all the way to assisting an entire career change into the industry. And uh, our goal of Magnamind is impacting as many careers as we can. This is just one way that we do so. Santos joins us as the senior data and scientist at Bayer Pharmaceuticals, where he handles IT solutions and he uses the same natural language processing that he will be talking about today in his day-to-day -day work. Before this, he's worked as a writer for several newspapers, both at the regional and national level. But he also has a really extensive education from all around the world. He's taken courses at King's College in London, Harvard University, University of Pisa, a PhD in philosophy from Hong Kong Polytechnic. He has postdoctoral work in Singapore University of Technology and Design, and most recently, postdoctoral studies at MIT. Now, before I turn it over to Enrico, I'd just like to now uh, welcome my boss, NS Sen, who will be giving a bit more about our upcoming education opportunities. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our meetup. Uh, this is Mohammed NS Sen. I am Chief Operating Officer of Magnamind Academy. As Magnamind Academy, we started four years ago uh, to teach uh, data science. We are a coding school, mostly focuses our operations in data science field. And we organized a lot, a lot of events. Last year, we uh, organized most, more than 100 events. And uh, these events are combining from meetups, workshops, and boot camps in different fields. And during the four years journey, uh, we, we've seen that there is a demand in the uh, market for project-based learning. And we organized our one-on-one uh, -on -one project mentorship bootcamp uh, with this purpose. During our project, mentor, uh, project mentorship bootcamp, uh, we you are working on different projects from different fields of data science. Uh, these projects are mostly machine learning, natural language processing uh, projects, and some image image cognition projects. And uh, you're dealing with social media data, stack analysis data, data, and uh, some images. Uh, we accept people with uh, a certain amount of technical knowledge, and uh, we, we prepare our uh, applicants for available positions in the industry. We help our students in resume pr preparing. Uh, we work with professional resume coach. We help them uh, to prepare uh, interviews. We organize mock-up interview sessions. And we set up industry insights meetings uh, where you can meet with uh, mentors from top uh, industry companies like Google, Apple, Facebook. And uh, during the bootcamp, you're interacting, you're uh, benefiting from the guidance of mentors with one-on-one -on -one sessions. You can ask your questions on your projects. And uh, at the end of the bootcamp, the aim is to find your position uh, in industry, in available positions. We have a recruiter network where we help you to find these uh, job, job positions. And uh, the students are very happy with, with the program. That's why we, we would like to inform you. And uh, if you're looking uh, for a real project with a real work group to work on, uh, this might be a fit for you, uh, our one-on-one -on -one project mentorship bootcamp. For further information, uh, you can visit our website, magnamindacademy.com. And in the uh, mentorship bootcamps tab, you can see the machine learning and data analysis one-on-one -on -one project mentorship bootcamp. And uh, you can ask our officials uh, to learn more and uh, join our program. Having said that, I would, uh, I would like to announce Enrico for his speech. Thank you for listening. Thank you. 
Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you just fine. Perfect. So thanks a lot for the introduction uh, to both of you. And uh, uh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks uh, for the invitation and everything. Um, today, as, uh, as it was mentioned, I will speak about natural language processing challenges and opportunities in healthcare. Um, the last uh, uh, two years I've been working uh, for uh, CCL MIT in the group of Regina Barzilai. So most of the uh, research I will talk about uh, were done uh, during that period. And in the last year, I've been working at Bayer and also some of the researchers that will be mentioned somehow relate to it. So let me start quickly. Um, um, making decisions is about taking one direction or another. It is estimated that an adult makes about 35,000 decisions per day. So it, it's true that most of them are about what to eat, what to wear, how to exercise and so on. But if you count them, they are more than 1 million decisions per month. So the question would be, how would we look like if we were going to take all of them wrong? In the uh, all joking aside, the issue of making uh, um, the right decision is one of the major concerns in the industry today. And if in certain domains, uh, the decision can affect only the revenues, which is not little, in some other domains like the healthcare, they actually affect and impact human lives. So we see this every day now with the COVID crisis, uh, where um, the countries that took the best decision at the very beginning are those that are actually uh, went out of the crisis uh, much earlier and could actually save thousands of lives. Whenever we uh, want to take the right decision, we also need to use the right information. In fact, it has been uh, uh, demonstrated that failure is four times more likely if we take uh, decisions in an informed way, independently of uh, uh, the decisions we are actually taking. Succeeding in business is about uh, a journey. It's about a journey from where you are and where you want to be. So which goal you want to achieve. And this journey is, uh, works better if you actually follow a path and you have the information to follow this path. This information is generally a map. But if you have a map like the one that you see in this slide, you are most likely to get lost and never get to uh, uh, reaching your goal. Something may get a little bit better if you have uh, uh, um, uh, a map like this one, where uh, uh, you have a little bit more of information. Uh, and so you may be able, after getting lost a few times, uh, to get to the destination. Um, probably uh, you will reach it uh, with uh, losing time, energies, and resources, and so on, because uh, this map is still not good enough. So the best case scenario is uh, when you have a map like this, uh, where your path is very clear, and you just uh, need to follow it to, to reach your, uh, your goal. In this case, you are actually uh, doing so in the most efficient and effective manner. From a business perspective, using the right map means uh, to use uh, as, much as, as much data as possible. Uh, so that you can uh, look at the historical patterns and extrapolate trends and insights uh, to predict the outcomes and generate actionable knowledge. And this is possible today thanks to um, this uh, 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 new uh, big data. Uh, big data is a neologism that describe a huge amount of data that are available to us nowadays. And the big data, we know they are characterized by several uh, specificities, uh, and one of them is velocity. In fact, uh, we uh, produced like 90% of uh, the data that exists in the world in the last two years, and data uh, production is growing by uh, 50 times per year since 2010. Um, just to give you some examples, we are producing 2.9 million emails per second, 20 hours of YouTube videos per minute, and 50 million tweets per day. And with such a big production and fast production, of course, the volume of data is growing in uh, an exponential way. Uh, we passed from 4.4 zettabytes in 2013 to 44 zettabytes in 2020. If we were to save uh, these uh, uh, 44 zettabytes uh, into tablets, like uh, uh, iPads or so, we would need uh, as many tablets as are needed to reach the moon 6.6 .6 times. With all this big, big data, are we actually using it? 
Well, the answer is no. Uh, according to a, a report by McKinsey in 2017, 90% um, of business decisions are still made on the base of factors such as education, instinct, and gut feeling. Um, according to a similar uh, survey done by P uh, PwC, uh, two thirds of the healthcare decisions are rarely or never based on data. And the reason is uh, because whenever we think about uh, big data, we imagine something like this. We imagine tables, uh, we imagine uh, uh, charts, uh, we imagine uh, everything well organized, uh, while actually big data looks much more like this. So you can imagine that uh, uh, with such a mess, uh, you can forget to get any insight out of it. We are basically at the paradox of being overloaded uh, with data, but under informed. And the reason uh, for uh, uh, this uh, mess in the data is that there are other two characteristics uh, uh, into, into the big data. One of them is variety. So uh, the data that has been uh, uh, that is, is generated daily is not interoperable and is generally not aggregated. It comes from different sources, and many of these sources are unstructured. Why? Because data is created for pe uh, from people to people, from people to machines, and from machines to people. So because humans don't speak the the the, the, uh, the computational language, uh, definitely. Uh, all this data is generated in a structured way. So like, for example, in simple text or narrative, uh, videos, images, uh, uh, audios, and so on. The other uh, characteristic of big data is that uh, big data is characterized by uh, biases. Uh, in fact, uh, um, there are some uh, classes in data that are overrepresented or underrepresented, and this affects the fairness of the data. Noise, um, in fact, uh, there are sometimes the, the signal is masked behind uh, such noise. Um, and anomalies, which sometimes can be uh, malicious, such as uh, the fake news in the media domain. Um, poor data quality is, is a big cost for the US. For example, IBM estimated it in $3.1 trillion. And now that you uh, know something more about data, you can uh, uh, clearly understand why um, we have a huge gap between uh, the amount of data that is available today and what we can actually do with it. This gap, unfortunately, exists also in the healthcare domain, where 80% of the data is unstructured and unfortunately untapped after creation. And when I uh, say untapped, it's because uh, uh, um, this data is never reutilized other than uh, in the simple uh, individual patient scenario in which the patient goes to the doctor and brings its own, uh, its own data to the, to the doctor to be analyzed. But even in this case, um, the only 65, uh, sorry, 65% uh, of the providers uh, uh, complain of being unable to, uh, to analyze all this, uh, uh, this data. So even in the individual case, uh, we are not uh, exploiting it properly. Uh, you can imagine on the population level. On the population level, we have millions of EHRs, insurance claims, radiological images, voice recordings that are sitting there for the benefit of none. And they contain socioeconomic information, patient medical histories, uh, diagnosis, treatments, uh, genetic information that are crucial for uh, prediction and uh, collecting insights and so on. So uh, the fact that we are not utilizing them is a big, big waste. So what happens when we have a problem in the healthcare domain and what we should do? Well, we should get all these unstructured data and uh, we should uh, utilize some text mining uh, uh, techniques um, and turn this uh, structured data into structured form, make it interoperable, aggregate it to other structured data that exist, and finally get insights uh, to um, generate actionable knowledge. As of today, this is done, uh, the first step, the text mining uh, part is done mostly manually. But humans are an outdated technology for this specific task. They uh, need to read sequentially. They can read up to 1,000 words per minute with 85% of understanding, which of course uh, uh, would be would require like uh, a, an eternity to analyze the full uh, uh, big data. So um, that's uh, also the reason why when uh, all the decision, all, all the clinical decisions that are made today are based only on the 3% of the population that participated to clinical trials. 
this is uh, uh, this has been uh, uh, noticed by cancer link you um so it's basically uh, we are trying to generalize a few insights that we can get from this 3% to the remaining 97%. And this is not very cool because actually we are missing quite a lot of information. It is somehow like uh, trying to appreciate Mona Lisa by looking on the left hand uh, part of this picture. Um, and uh, you can understand this is not possible. Um, so, um, what we would need instead is uh, to utilize a technology such as natural language processing. And uh, um, natural language processing is uh, a, a subfield of uh, uh, artificial intelligence that uh, um, has, uh, has done a lot of uh, uh, news recently. Um, and its, uh, its goal is to, to manipulate, understand, and generate human language for several purposes, uh, the healthcare uh, being one of them. Um, natural language processing is based on machine learning and uh, deep learning algorithms, of course, and um, it was based until a few years ago on uh, rule-based approaches. In the last years, uh, between MIT and Bayer, I have uh, mostly worked in uh, the application of uh, natural language processing to problems such as uh, turning uh, a printed document into a digital form through uh, OCR um, algorithms, or organizing digital document into categories uh, according to certain criteria, uh, identifying relevant information in, the, in this digital document and structure them in tabular form, such as in Excel files, um, retrieving the evidence uh, uh, for uh, claims, so verifying the claim veracity, uh, for example, in fake news detection, where you want to double check whether something is true, and um, exploiting the information that I have uh, uh, extracted through all these methods and verified it through all these methods for clinical uh, purposes, such as uh, risk prediction uh, and uh, patient selection. And now I'd like to enter a little bit into uh, some uh, use cases that uh, uh, I've been addressing in the last few years. The first, uh, the first of them uh, is uh, um, it comes from a paper uh, titled uh, "Do Neural Information Extraction Algorithms Generalize Across Institutions?" Um, you can find it online. Um, it was uh, it started as a collaboration between MIT and MGH, and we developed a convolutional neural network to extract information from twenty five thousand pathology reports, in particular breast pathology reports, which were originated in seven uh, hospitals. The breast pathology reports are notes that are written in uh, uh, normal and free narrative, and they contain crucial information about the tumor, such as uh, the histology, the location, and so on. Our goal was uh, twofold. We wanted to generate a system that could substitute the uh, very commonly used and imprecise uh, rule-based approaches, and we wanted to check whether the system was able to generalize better than the rules to data coming from multiple institutions. In fact, as you uh, can understand, every single institution has its own way to uh, write down uh, the, the, the reports. And uh, these differences uh, uh, generate uh, problems in every algorithm because algorithms tend to uh, look for regularities. Um, so we wanted to see how good the uh, convolutional neural networks uh, were to, uh, to, to, to work on, uh, on this different data. Here you see um, an example of a, a pathology report on the left side, uh, it's in free narrative, and you see on the right side the table. So basically we got this report and we tried to identify several uh, attributes and check whether they were present or not. Um, the data was coming from, as I said, from seven hospitals, five in the area of Boston, um, and uh, one from Detroit and one from Pakistan. Um, as you can see, the distribution of the population was mostly uh, white people, uh, while there were some uh, uh, minorities represented uh, between 2 and 4 percent of the population. And uh, the average age was uh, 56 years old. But of course, uh, the majority of the participants, uh, the, the, the patients, were uh, uh, women that uh, were uh, at visits between uh, 1987 and 2017. So let me uh, describe a little bit the method. You see here, uh, there is the report on the top uh, left. And the report goes, uh, uh, is basically transformed into a matrix of word embeddings, where every word embeddings represent uh, uh, the meaning of one word, uh, the contextual meaning of one word. And this matrix went through a convolutional layer 
uh, which uh, add several filters and then the convolution layer turn it into a, a vector through the max over time pooling. And finally, there was the softmax to the return uh, the um, uh, distribution over the classes, so over the classes present or absent. And this was verified, of course, uh, against the ground truth during training to, to, to uh, calculate the loss and so on. And here, let me describe very quickly the results. Um, what you see here is basically two um, learning curves. Uh, on the left side, uh, you see the learning curve of known uh, during training institutions. And on the right side, you, you see the held out institutions. Uh, there are three um, lines and three curves uh, because, it, uh, because one of them is uh, basically describing a CNN train only on one institution. One is uh, describing a CNN train on two institutions and one at CNN uh, train on three, uh, sorry, on four institutions. Um, on the x-axis, you see that uh, the number of examples that uh, the system needed to achieve uh, uh, good performance. So what you can notice on the left, uh, uh, on the left chart is that uh, the uh, accuracy was basically around 95, 96%, and almost uh, uh, the, the three the three settings were working kind of equally. Um, the only thing you can you can notice here is that the four institution uh, CNN uh, took a little bit longer to uh, to improve. It needed about 4,500 uh, examples to, to get to the level of the others. Um, you will notice a similar pattern in the right side of the chart. So the uh, four institutions actually outperform all the other uh, system uh, in, uh, in uh, data coming from institutions that were not known during the, during the training, uh, but it needs much more data to generalize, actually. Um, while you can also notice that the single the, the CNN train on the single institutions was basically unable to generalize. In fact, it stays, uh, its performance is like uh, three points, uh, approximately two, three points behind uh, the other uh, settings. Good, and so uh, this study was meant to provide the physician with a, a tool that uh, could quickly extract the useful information uh, so, such that they could perform analysis on a large, a large amount of data. And uh, these analyses are very helpful to do retrospective studies or to take informed decision, clinical informed decisions. Um, what is uh, um, very interesting is that studies after uh, um, this, uh, this method was available uh, could uh, basically analyze uh, past from 300 uh, 36 or 674 uh, cases, uh, they could start analyzing 6,000 cases. So you can imagine you're going to have a much uh, more defined and high resolution uh, uh, picture of the phenomenon that you are uh, studying. The performance of the system was, uh, as I said, about 96%, which was somehow comparable to the one of humans. And uh, for this reason, uh, it, is, um, it is possible to uh, basically utilize also in the clinical setting. Uh, we extended the uh, system to uh, work also on other organs, such as brain, lung, pancreas, prostate, and so on. And, uh, mm, but what, uh, what is interesting is that uh, sometimes data is not coming all in the form of a digital narrative. It may also come in the form of uh, scanned documents. And the scanned documents, uh, somehow they have a layout, they, are diff they have different templates, different layout. And these layouts sometimes are informative. So you don't want only to look at the text, but you also want to look at the layout of uh, the form that is coming in. And this was uh, instead the goal of uh, the second use case that I want to uh, talk about. Uh, this work was done at, again at CCL MIT. And uh, it is about extracting uh, uh, patient information uh, and side effect information from uh, printed adverse event reports. Why uh, uh, is this uh, task important? Uh, clinical trials are not sufficient to identify all the adverse events. So FDA requires uh, pharma companies to monitor the market and uh, make sure that uh, unexpected adverse events or, or side effects of the drugs are immediately identified and investigated so that uh, actions uh, are taken to avoid harm for the population. Um, every pharma company has its own uh, pharmacovigilance departments that uh, uh, work to identify these uh, uh, side effects. 
uh, but they are overwhelmed um, because as you can see from this chart, uh, the number of uh, uh, reports is growing uh, exponentially. And uh, it was uh, in 2006, it was uh, 400K, while now, uh, well, in 2015, uh, it was about uh, uh, 1 million and 400K. And now probably we are talking about over 3 million uh, reports uh, uh, per year. And how do they look? Well, these reports look somehow like this. Um, don't worry if uh, the image is blurred. Uh, it was uh, blurred for privacy reasons. Um, um, so you can see very clearly that uh, uh, there are different uh, kind of templates uh, and you can uh, create some rule-based approaches, uh, but uh, you need to set some rules for every type of template. Um, so what uh, you instead uh, would desire is to have a machine learning approach that can uh, generalize uh, uh, quickly on uh, new templates in case they, they, will, uh, they will arrive. We uh, received a data set uh, of 80,000 annotated uh, reports uh, that were collected in five years. Uh, the average length uh, of each report was nine pages. Uh, the number of templates in this set was over 15. And uh, we had to extract eight attributes, uh, including the name, surname of the patient, the date of birth, the date of uh, the side effect, the drug, uh, the kind of event, the kind of side effect that, uh, that was uh, included. And uh, as you can imagine, each of these attributes had a different uh, uh, type. So here you can see on the left some mock-up examples. Uh, you see highlighted the sum of the information that we wanted to extract. And uh, uh, I show you immediately how we uh, work. We basically transform these uh, um, reports into uh, graphs, as you can see here on the right. And uh, these graphs were built by uh, drawing a B box around every single pieces of text. Uh, and uh, connecting this uh, uh, B box through uh, horizontal and vertical edges. And uh, uh, under the idea that proximity is uh, somehow representing uh, uh, the uh, layout. Okay, so these graphs uh, uh, basically represent the layout. And then we had to pass these graphs to a neural network. We implemented a graph convolution neural network with an encoder and a decoder and a graph module in the middle. The encoder uh, uh, encode each uh, uh, B box. Uh, and then uh, the B box are somehow, all of them are somehow um, put in communication with the other B box uh, uh, into the graph module. And finally, each B box was decoded uh, into the decoder, and uh, uh, which we should output whether the uh, B box was containing some relevant information, like, such as a date, a CD, and so on. And the performance of the system was uh, uh, 1.1, 1, 1, 1 point above uh, the uh, most uh, well-known um, LSTM, by LSTM. Uh, so it, it beat basically a state-of-the-art uh, system. And what it was uh, more important is that uh, uh, when a new template was uh, presented to the system only in the test uh, set, uh, the by LSTM dropped uh, uh, its performance to 13%, while our system dropped uh, to 33%, which is low, but you can see the difference in, uh, in drop. So meaning that our system is uh, uh, mm, more able to generalize. And if we have, of course, more data, we are likely to uh, make it uh, even uh, better in the generalization skill. And finally, the last uh, use case that I'd like to present to you is uh, um, a, a project that, uh, on which I work with uh, Dana Farber, um, and it's about improving patient selection for cardiac resynchronization therapy, which is also known as a CRT. Um, so why is this uh, relevant? As, as I said before, uh, data can be extracted from uh, documents to do retrospective studies but it can also be utilized for other goals. And in this case, it's a clinical goal. You want to uh, understand whether a patient will benefit or not uh, for, uh, for out of a procedure. Uh, the CRT is the procedure that is associated with reduction of failure hospitalization and improved survival, but it's also a very risky and expensive procedure. So you may want to uh, avoid doing this procedure to patients that are at high risk. 
Uh, from the literature, we found out that one third of the patients that actually go through uh, this procedure do not benefit from it uh, uh, in the assessments that uh, are carried out in the next 18 months. And the subgroups of them even die for, uh, from uh, heart failures or comorbidities. So uh, in order to uh, generate our system, we had uh, to collect uh, data. We collected from uh, um, two Boston hospitals, uh, uh, patient uh, uh, that uh, had visits between 2004 and 2015. There were 990 patients. Each of them had uh, 75 clinical notes. Um, the population was uh, uh, on average 71 years old. 87% of the population was white, but there were also minority represented in minor uh, form. And 78% of the population were males, while 21% female. Um, the mean uh, left ventricular ejection fraction was 24.8%, uh, uh, which is uh, somehow a measure of uh, the uh, benefit. Um, in fact, we utilized, uh, uh, we decided to, to, to measure the reduced benefit as uh, um, less than 0% improvement uh, in LVEF uh, in the next uh, 6 uh, 18 months uh, after the operation. And uh, another way to measure the non-benefit is the death within the 18 months. And we identified 403 uh, people, so 40% of the patients, that had the reduced benefit. 25% of them had no improvement, and 15% of them actually unfortunately died. To uh, uh, work uh, in our system, we utilize a large number of structure and structured data, including demographics, uh, such as gender, age, and so on, the past uh, health service utilization, the billing codes, the encounter information, uh, such as the type, the length of stay, and so on, laboratory values, medications, clinical information, and EHR narrative. Okay, so the EHR narrative was the unstructured part. Again, we had to aggregate all this information, as uh, we have discussed before, and uh, finally, we had to get the insights to uh, obtain the actionable knowledge. We divided the data set in 80% for training, 20% for testing. We uh, utilized multiple classifiers, including logistic regression, uh, support vector machine, uh, random forest, and extreme gradient boosting. And uh, the latest was the one that performed better. We uh, optimize the system uh, uh, in order to, uh, we optimize actually the hyperparameters uh, on the validation set um, in order to optimize the uh, F beta score. Uh, and uh, we finally test the best model on the 20% test. Set. The final model could identify 26% of the patients with reduced benefit uh, with a precision of 79%. So uh, you see this result uh, represented on the picture on the right. Uh, out of 100 uh, people, uh, we were basically able to identify those uh, uh, pink um, uh, people that were not going to benefit. Um, of course, we are not identifying all of them, but still uh, we could have uh, uh, somehow uh, allowed the, the improved the patient selection. So let me uh, get towards conclusions. Uh, and uh, let me tell you that uh, I don't have any conclusion because the story of NLP has uh, just uh, started. Um, what uh, is interesting in this moment is that uh, the US is spending about uh, 17 to 18% of the GDP in healthcare for a total cost of $3.7 trillion, which is uh, $10,000 per capita. NLP uh, promises to increase speed, efficiency, efficacy, and also humanity of the healthcare, moving the focus from care to health through prevention, early diagnosis, and easier treatments. There is a lot uh, of uh, um, opportunities here to cut the costs, for example, by improving uh, the, uh, the care coordination, uh, reducing the unnecessary service utilization, preventing uh, the chronic uh, disease, uh, allocating efficiently the internal resources. And there is uh, also the possibility of uh, preventing and uh, improving the treatment, for example, by monitoring the patients also in uh, uh, settings that are not the traditional ones inside the clinics, um, uh, checking, for example, the medication adherence and management. Uh, you may also want to do on-base monitoring. You may want to improve uh, also the patient uh, 
provider interactions um, because uh, the provider may access to more data and they may have more free time to uh, discuss with their patients. And finally, there are some uh, uh, incredible cutting edge innovations that uh, can be implemented, such as precision medicine, which utilizes massive amount of data to tailor individual treatments. So we are getting there uh, and NLP is definitely a tool that is crucial for uh, this goal. Um, and uh, this, uh, given this, uh, you shouldn't be surprised that uh, uh, the global NLP in healthcare and life sciences market will grow from 1.5 billion to 3.7 billion in the next five years with a compound annual growth rate of 20.5 percent uh, with uh, North America, Europe and the pack leading the market. And uh, the COVID crisis has uh, most likely uh, accelerated this process so probably this number will be even uh, bigger uh, very soon. Uh, but we are still pretty late, actually, because uh, if we had these technologies well organized at the beginning of uh, this uh, year, probably 2020 would have been a totally different year. Is there any question or any? I'm not sure if. Uh... Uh, yes. Um, it looks like we have a few questions in the chat. And if there's any more questions, please ask them uh, now or in the Q&A section. Uh, if you open the, the Q&A part, it should be right next to the share screen button. You can go ahead and see them. So uh, can anyone else? Uh, OK. What is the initiative for provider to use AI or NLP? Um, so recently, uh, I've seen that uh, uh, the US has, uh, has generated this, uh, this new paradigm of uh, healthcare, uh, which is called value-based healthcare in which uh, um, the providers are somehow, uh, they, they get uh, funds depending on the quality of their service in terms of uh, actually success, success outcomes. Uh, and, uh, and also in terms of uh, how they, how many resources they have. So AI and NLP are definitely uh, important tools uh, uh, to allow this uh, this value-based healthcare, and this is where we are going. Okay, um, I see Sasha uh, asks uh, what uh, would be the most important tool to learn if I'm interested in a career in NLP. Um, I'm not sure if uh, by tool you mean uh, software. Uh, what I can tell you what I've done. So uh, from uh, the, the university perspective, you may want to learn Python if you haven't uh, learned it yet. And uh, with Python, uh, all the libraries, scientific libraries such as NumPy, such as uh, TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, and so on. These uh, libraries are not complicated. Uh, machine learning, data science, uh, NLP are not complicated. Um, don't get scared by the the initial uh, uh, when you when you get in at the beginning it, they they look like uh, complicated um, concepts but uh, as soon as you play a little bit with the code you will see you can uh, you can learn pretty quickly I, I don't know your background but I think uh, you should uh, give it a try if you are interested uh, Nitin writes, uh, uh, what are the efforts you see in the industry in terms of uh, getting digital records from healthcare providers hospital? Uh, that's a good question, uh, thanks. Um, it's a very, as if I understood correctly your question actually, uh, it's very hard to get uh, uh, this, uh, this data. It's very hard because of privacy reasons, uh, because of uh, uh, because they are a, a resource and uh, uh, every institution now is uh, realizing they are a resource so they can have a market out of it um, so it's uh, it's very complicated um, but um, there is also a, a big interest in the industry so there are now more and more startups uh, and uh, companies that are trying to um, uh, be the middleman to connect uh, the, the institutions, the providers, hospitals, and so on to, uh, to the corporations to get this, uh, this information. Um, uh, 
uh, what challenges do you have uh, gaining data from EHR? Uh, challenges, uh, uh, you mean uh, in terms of, in algorithmic terms? Um, if yes, uh, and you are familiar with, uh, with NLP, machine learning, uh, you have two types of uh, uh, challenges. One is the classification challenge. The other one is the uh, tagging challenge. And it depends on how you get the source data, whether you get it in a, in a digital form or you get it in a uh, scan form, like uh, as I presented before. Um, so mm, you want uh, one of the challenges is the, the other one that I presented before, that every single uh, institutions utilize different jargon, different way of, uh, of writing the, for, the, 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 the EHR. Um, there are uh, biases, uh, there are uh, categories uh, that are overrepresented or underrepresented that you may want to have a system that is able to uh, get the data information out of the HR uh, equally for every category. And I'm mm, referring to gender, race and other uh, categories um, and so on. Um, okay, uh, Sasha seems to have some experiences. I'm happy about that. Uh, we can uh, get connected if you, if you need some suggestion in the future, what are top two, three AI NLP solution for healthcare that uh, have proven uh, return on investment and relatively low cost of adoption? Um, that's a that's a very good question, and I have to say that I'm not uh, hyper familiar with uh, with this. Um, definitely, there is a, a, a big. Uh, we are in a moment in which. Uh, in which there is a lot of uh, uh, evolution of the systems into uh, the academic institutions and the industry is starting getting interested into it. And of course, uh, when uh, something is so new, there are a lot of failures. Um, but uh, I know for sure that, for example, in our lab, Regina uh, Barzilai and uh, other colleagues of mine have developed an antibiotic uh, that uh, uh, is not subject to the resistance uh, we have uh, we develop for other antibiotics. So you know, like to develop to 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 develop an antibiotic in the uh, pharma. Uh, now you, you need to spend about two. Uh, I don't remember. If, I think it's two billion in about ten years. Uh, double check these numbers, but uh, it's about two billion uh, in ten years. And um, and uh, Regina managed to do that. Uh, uh, with uh, all the other colleagues uh, uh, with an AI solution and in, uh, in of course, a much uh, more uh, smaller time uh, timeline. Uh, we're talking about a few months. So you can imagine uh, uh, how much uh, uh, return of on investment there might be there. Okay, I keep going. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if I'm, uh, if I'm going too long. Uh, I guess different hospitals use different abbreviations and codes in uh, physician notes. Uh, how do you take care of that situations when you combine from four different sources? Um, well, uh, we had to, to we what we have done was a classifier mostly, uh, as you probably have noticed, as a CNN. Um, we didn't uh, utilize any pre-processing. Um, we were lucky to have uh, a relatively high number of uh, uh, of um, reports, so uh, we kind of optimized the embeddings. Uh, and by optimizing the embeddings on the context, uh, sometimes you can have similarities between the different codes and the different mm, words that are used with the same meaning, right? Um, so that that might answer your question. We also uh, improved the system, but I didn't describe it here, but we also improved the system by using uh, character embeddings. Ken, how important is processing or not processing knowledge uh, of uh, medical therapeutic technology? or background critical in getting to NLP in healthcare sector. Um, uh, can, uh, I can speak uh, for myself. Uh, I'm not uh, an expert in healthcare. Uh, when I joined uh, MIT in 2017, I basically didn't know anything about healthcare, but uh, I joined a lab that uh, had several, uh, work in several domains and healthcare was one of them. And I started, uh, it, it, it was a barrier at the beginning, but after one year um, discussing uh, daily with people that work in that domain, 
uh, you're gonna catch up and uh, maybe you want to be the one uh, um, uh, proposing new uh, ideas but you'll be the one executing them at the beginning until you get familiar and then at the point you're gonna be the, the, the one proposing also so it, it may take a little bit of time but um, i believe uh, uh, you can get there uh then uh, can machine learning help in generating synthetic data uh, for healthcare domain um uh, if you mean by synthetic data like data augmentation something like that um if you mean that yes of course you can generate uh, you can uh, generate synthetic data uh, but i'm not sure um how for what you want to use it that's uh, that's uh, crucial um what, what would be the, the goal of generating it? Is uh, for uh, improving the system, creating more data for, for training the system or something else? If you can specify in the chat, it's, uh, it, it, it would help. Uh, how do you think machine learning, deep learning can help people who don't have access to first class care? Can you talk about some cases you know? Okay, yes, this, uh, Nitin, this is a uh, related to the value-based uh, um, healthcare. So the idea is uh, to reduce uh, the cost, the production cost. And uh, when you reduce the production cost, uh, possibly you can also uh, reduce the, 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 the cost on the market, right? And uh, there ne you need also policies uh, to, to support uh, such, a, such a reduction. Um, because the market, uh, especially in, in, in a country like the US, where the market is uh, totally uh, liberal and open, uh, is complicated. You will always have somebody that uh, uh, run behind uh, these rights. Um, they should have the right, actually, to access to it. So it's a little bit complicated. Unfortunately, I cannot give you a clear answer. But what I can say is that if the system is more efficient and you can save time, energy, resources, uh, uh, and so on, you can definitely uh, help more people and probably at a cheaper cost. I think I've answered. Oh, no, there's something more. We're testing. The yeah, there's actually a few more questions in the chat as well. Uh, it looks like there's two more in the chat when you're done with the Q&A ones. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the chat, uh, okay, uh, I will need to find it. Um, okay, so how do you feel about chat? But uh, okay, let me answer before on uh, data augmentation, uh, testing different scenarios. So for testing different scenarios, uh, uh, what uh, I suggest is to have uh, uh, a, um, a number of sources in the training. Uh, a large number of sources in the training such that your system has somehow uh, seen some variance during training and then you can also test uh, different scenarios uh, definitely you can create you can utilize uh, some uh, data augmentation algorithms to to create uh, more data that maybe is in between existing data uh, to or use adversarial neural network uh, for example for this scope you can do that i don't know though uh, whether this will like actually help uh, uh, your Okay, so this is this would be a good experiment mm, from what I can tell. So Sasha, how do you feel about chatbot-based telemedicine? I guess I'm curious to find out whether poor user could affect the promotion. Okay, yes. Um, yes, definitely the chatbot uh, uh, can be something useful in the future. We have to be very careful because now, of course, they are not uh, uh, very reliable. And uh, especially when we are talking about chatbots on open domain, uh, we can have a very reliable chatbots on uh, closed domains, but uh, uh, we are talking about something that is more similar to a rule-based uh, uh, system rather than, uh, than open domain. So if we are talking about clinical decisions, uh, um, you want to have a very, very strong chatbot that, uh, that uh, um, may actually help uh, the people and not uh, uh, mislead them. Um, I believe in the future, this uh, will also help to reduce the cost and therefore uh, help uh, also the, the classes, that, the, the social classes that currently have difficulties in affording these, uh, these services. Um, since supervised machine learning requires labeling, could you please speak about the additional dollars cost per patient encounter per test to create a label data for training either? Well, um, 
the, there's not an additional cost in, in, in the reality. I mean, what you want to do is, uh, is uh, to create a system that has a good return uh, uh, of the investment. So the additional cost uh, is only initial, but then uh, you, you want to have a good return on, uh, on that. Uh, so far, this annotation, labeling, uh, however you want to call it, uh, are done uh, uh, for research. Like uh, uh, in the collaboration that I've uh, uh, um, shown before with MGH, Dana Farber, and so on, there were physicians that could spend part of their working day, they need to do research anyway, and they were uh, spending part of their working day on labeling and uh, supporting us from that, uh, that perspective. So. Um, labeling is a cost, but if it, it works it, why not? Why not uh, spending it? Um, unfortunately, I cannot tell you the percentage. Uh, depends. Uh, I, I believe that uh, what you need to look is not the cost of annotating, but is the cost uh, that you are saving uh, once the system works. I can actually just read them uh, off to you if you want. There's only two questions. Yes, thank you, because I, I don't see it. I don't see this yet. Yeah, no problem. Uh, this, the first one is from Augustine Jopis, or Augustine Joseph. Uh, different hospitals use different abbreviations and codes in physician notes. How did I you take care of that probably... situation when you combined uh, data from four different resources? Right, right. I think I went there already. Oh, uh, did you get the one uh, about the hammer and the nail as well? About what? Uh, the, the one after that is when you have have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Why not form a committee to standardize health forms instead? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, comment. Uh, I totally agree. The problem is that uh, um, we work on uh, historical data. Historical data come from, as you have seen, uh, for example, 1987 or even before. And uh, yes, you can uh, standardize. And I hope that uh, we go in that direction because for the future, Definitely, we need to standardize and to structure data as much as possible. Uh, so you, yours is actually a very good comment. Um, however, uh, since now machine learning uh, needs to rely on, uh, on previous data, all the studies are done on previous data. And uh, uh, as I was mentioning, researchers, uh, uh, physicians, and so on have to read these long PDFs uh, from uh, the, the, the patient history uh, and so on. Yeah, there you want a system that can do that for you because we are talking about uh, millions of uh, EHR, not uh, not few hundred, and that's uh, also the return of investment. Uh, if uh, uh, for extracting information from millions of EHR, you have to spend uh, 500k or one million or two million dollars, I mean it's not a big uh, cost, right? Uh, all right. Well, if there's any more, if there isn't any more questions, we can. Uh, oh, uh, it looks like there's one more in the uh, Q&A section. I just popped up. Yes, I see that. Um, so one of the biggest problems in healthcare in the US are medical errors. Uh, are there instances where AI and LP is already helping to improve the situation uh, or uh, this is not the area that we can address? Yeah, so this is a very, very good question. So human uh, uh, make errors, make mistakes. Uh, and uh, similarly do computers uh, and do natural language proce processing AI and so on. Um, you know, when humans do uh, mistakes, uh, generally they, they are liable for them. Um, when uh, computers do mistakes, uh, we don't know who is liable. And this is one of the reasons why uh, um, AI is not uh, already well implemented in the clinical setting together with another one, another reason, which is the interpretability. Um, not only you want to know when uh, the system makes mistakes or it doesn't make mistakes, but you also want to know why it made a mistake or why it didn't make a mistake. Um, the, the interpretability is, uh, is crucial because when a doctor um, makes a decision, uh, the doctor can motivate such a decision on the base of something, whether it's a uh, radiological image or whatever it is. Um, we don't have uh, this kind of uh, clarity and interpretability in uh, NLP and in uh, AI in general. And uh, all these reasons are, um, uh, are somehow why uh, AI and NLP are not yet in the clinical setting. Um, however, uh, they can support uh, human decisions. 
Um, so at MGH, they are using this information extraction. We know 96% of the information, uh, 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 the accuracy is 96%, so there is a 4% of error. But somehow, uh, because you are getting a large amount of data, this error is not that relevant. Also because we know for sure that also humans, uh, the internal notator agreement uh, report like uh, a lot of errors too. So um, definitely machine learning and AI can support, but they cannot improve human performance. Not, Looks not, like there's a few more. Say it again. Ah, oh, yes. Oh my God, they keep arriving. <laughs> um, um yeah so ken uh thanks for your question so uh, shortly ken is asking uh, um if we utilize all this data that nlp can eventually extract and so on uh, how this uh, will improve uh, the individual the treatment for the individual cases if i understood correctly the question it will improve a lot it will improve a lot because when you work on the precision medicine um, as i said precision medicine utilizes a huge amount of data to tailor treatments for uh, some individuals um, and uh, so what the more data you have the better you can understand the phenomenon and mm, the better you can take decisions it's like the metaphor of the map that i've given at the beginning of the uh, of the talk um, this is the reason why NLP and machine learning are crucial in, in this. Um, uh, when I close the, the talk by saying that if we had uh, all the system uh, implemented by uh, uh, January 2020, probably this year would have been a different year. I really meant it because uh, uh, what happened, I, I don't know if you uh, recall it, but what happened is that we were lost uh, when, uh, when there was this, uh, this crisis. Um, we didn't know where to get information. We had uh, uh, certain institutions telling us something, other institutions telling us something else. Um, you could have found uh, uh, papers uh, suggesting uh, uh, one direction rather than another and so on. And uh, um, you couldn't actually uh, have the, uh, a, a clear view on the, on the information. So uh, it's crucial uh, to have these systems uh, uh, running as soon as possible. The general trend of machine learning in healthcare. How much is the uh, uh, tech industry adopting it? Where do you see it going in the next uh, five, ten years? Okay, uh, Nitin, let me tell you what I've seen uh, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So I, I've seen that an, uh, AI in general has been adopted on uh, multiple levels. So one level was the epidemiological level, uh, where uh, AI was utilized to identify uh, for example, uh, uh, hotspots by looking at uh, the wearables. If uh, there were, for example, um, the heartbeat was rising in an area, uh, the, the average heartbeat was higher in an area, um, this, uh, this was a signal that that area could have been an hotspot of the virus. Um, let me tell you all, uh, all these uh, this, um, kind of things I'm telling you now to, uh, are, are on the research level. They were not utilized uh, in the clinical level, exactly because of the reasons that I explained before. But uh, I keep going. So epidemiological level, this one. Um, it was, uh, of course, data analysis helped also to identify the number of uh, uh, people that were um, that didn't have symptoms but still have the virus, which is also a very important information. Um, on the another level was the risk prediction. Uh, so uh, risk prediction is crucial uh, to identify um, uh, what uh, what are the risks of a person to develop a disease, but not only, also to uh, identify what kind of uh, uh, drugs treatments that person may need. Uh, for example, the University of Cambridge have done a study uh, that could somehow predict all the patient journey. And the patient journey include whether the patient needed an ICU, needed a, re a respirator, or other kind of resources. And if you have like, 
hundreds of patients coming to your hospital, you can predict at the very beginning, as soon as they do some blood test, uh, whether they need the respirator, the ICU, and the other kind of resources, then you can allocate these resources in a smarter way and definitely uh, you can save more lives. Um, so this was another utilization. Another, other utilizations include the diagnosis. Uh, everyone is, has probably heard about uh, the convolution neural network going uh, through the um, X-ray or other images, fMRI and so on, to identify uh, either uh, cancers uh, and, uh, or, or other, uh, other kind of disease. Um, it was utilized also for uh, uh, COVID, especially in China and uh, more recently in the US. And it worked very well and it actually outperformed serological uh, tests. So um, the diagnosis was another um, sector in which AI was applied. And then there was the treatment. The treatment, uh, a lot of uh, um, startups and companies have started uh, uh, analyzing. Uh, uh, all their data to try to identify uh, a vaccine. Um, this is, uh, has happened both on the uh, industrial and uh, uh, research uh, sector. Um, and the, probably they have accelerated the, the research in that perspective. Um, so I think uh, I may have uh, answered you a little bit. Let me go ahead. Um, Yes, Susan uh, speaks about outliers in healthcare decisions. Yes, this, uh, that's a very, very um, uh, important point. Um, and this is uh, the problem of bias. Uh, some categories are overrepresented, so the system tend to work better for these categories, uh, while some uh, other categories are underrepresented, and uh, so the system fails with, uh, with them. So one, uh, before we were speaking about data augmentation, and data augmentation is uh, also a way to reduce the bias. For example, you may augment the data of the underrepresented categories. This is typical in AI, NLP, machine learning, deep learning, and so on. Um, other thing you can utilize is uh, to expand the, the dimensions of your data. Uh, and in fact, uh, more recently, uh, there's a lot of research in genomics. Genomics uh, uh, is uh, much more uh, precise, describes uh, um, data at a different uh, level, the, the, the information at a different level, and it allows to be a little bit more precise also on the outliers. And that's why precision medicine is actually more focused on the outliers rather than uh, on the uh, on the mass of the people. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, making a more right way in the um, I'm not sure to say the truth. I, I don't know the difference between uh, AI for veterinary medicine and uh, humans. I believe. Uh, the one for humans is, uh, is investigated much more uh, because it's a bigger market. Uh, there's definitely much more investment there. But honestly, I'm not uh, I'm not expert in, in this, so I'd rather not answer. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, I guess that's the end of our talk. Thank you so much, Enrico, for joining us, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we hold these talks to keep people learning and uh, inspiring people to further their learning during the quarantine and COVID-19 and everything else that's going on. So uh, thank you all for doing that today and participating. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, tell us what you think about today's meetup or about the online Zoom format in the comment section. Also, please join us for our next scheduled meetup. It's going to be on August 28th, where we'll be having another edition of our AI and AI Talks and Healthcare series. Thank you and have a good night, everyone. Thanks everyone for the questions and for the invitation. Thank you.